We've dropped by this morning, almost unannounced, to talk to Thomas Mosier. And anyone who has seen Thomas Moser's furniture or cabinet work has got to say that this man is a marvelous craftsman. And one of the most interesting things about Thomas Moser when he first started out here in New Gloucester, Maine, as a cabinet maker in 1971, was the fact that he had, well, dropped out or dropped in, depending on how you look at it, uh, but he is formerly the head of the speech department of Bates College in Lewiston, Maine. And it seems like sort of a strange transition. Mr. Moser, why did you do that? Well, I don't know. There I, I have a feeling that life can sometimes uh, best be lived in serial fashion. You know, you don't... You, the idea of having to stay at one thing for a whole life is, uh, does not offer as many challenges as variety. Plus, I think the fact that, uh, that uh, my interest in uh, craftsmanship, my interest in uh, three-dimensional design uh, was always there. I got a PhD and then I taught for 12 years and I figured uh, that was enough and it's time to do something else. Where did you develop originally the, the, the inordinate skill of some of the uh, some of the craftsmanship that I, for instance, have seen? Well, I, old time I, uh, dovetailing yeah. and cabinetry and all that stuff. Some people have a natural bent. I think uh, to say that it's innate or inherent, I think is, you know, you, you have to have a temperament uh, for it. You have to have sort of a covenant with wood. You have to, and, and, and I think that relationship between a man and, 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 a, and a material is, is to some extent inherited or innate. Uh, and then as far as learning it is concerned, uh, uh, I like to think that I've learned from a lot of dead people because I have for years taken apart old furniture, uh, 18th and 19th century furniture and cabinetry and houses and in the process of fixing up and repairing old antiques and so forth, you, you kind of get a feeling for what the man was doing 100 or 200 years ago. You know, you can see it in his work. You can, you can it's as though he's teaching you today, even though he's uh, perhaps anonymous and long gone. So I learned a great deal from, uh, from looking at the work of the past, and I've learned an enormous amount from the guys in the shop now. I'm not alone. We teach each other a great deal, and we're always learning. Uh. Tom, you're working on uh, what looks like one of those beautiful antique chairs that one always sees in collections. What is it? Well, it's uh, it's based on a on a Windsor form, but it uh, a, a, a traditional Windsor, but it's a kind of a contemporary chair. This is a this is number two out of what I hope was going to be an ultimate design. You go by trial and error. Uh, Are you uh, saying this is a Tom Moser design? Well, pretty well, more or less. There's, if there's if there is such a thing that. This has evolved from the shop. We've all uh, sat in it 20 times. This isn't the finished piece. We've still got some minor changes to make on it. The biggest problem we've had with this is trying to figure out how to manufacture that curve because uh, it's a compound curve, and this is done with laminates. In other words, there are seven, seven strips of wood that are glued together which, and then pressed together, which make that curve for strength. Somebody was saying earlier that he, loved, he likes the chair, but he thinks it's weak. Uh, it isn't weak. Well, it, looks it, it, looks, it looks fragile, but it is, when it's done, it should be ex very, very strong because there's antagonism throughout, you know, where the joints are holding each other together. And that's the principle. But we do a lot of work by hand. All the, most of the joints are hand cut. And uh, some of the tools which are perhaps brand new but patterned after the old tools would be like the back saw, which is uh, used for cutting dovetails. Uh, and this saw is kind of interesting. I was introduced to that last year. This is a Japanese saw. The Western saw, of course, is the cutting is done by push the push stroke. And so what you do are you're constantly pushing in order to cut through the board. And because of that, you've got to have a fairly thick blade or else it'll spring on you. But the Japanese, they don't Crafty push. They, they, they pull. Now this is not a samurai. This is a, a, a this is a, a cross-cut saw uh, and a rip saw. It makes a great nubby cutter because you can get flush with it. Because of uh, the thinness of the blade. Yes. Oh, it's a marvelous experience to cut nubbies with this saw. Chris Tom Moser says that uh, you're one of the world's greatest hand tool experts. What out of all that array of tools that you have behind you? What's your favorite tool? for hand woodworking? Uh, my favorite or the one I use the most? Well, whichever. 
One of each. Which is your favorite and which one oh, do you use? Oh, I'd have to say this old plane here is probably my favorite. It was um, given to me by, by my father. It's an old widow's tooth. Can you show us how you dovetail? Yes, I so. can. There's no trade secret to it. It's been done for many, many years. And uh, the first you make your front of your cabinet, you might fit it and have it all ready to, to mark out. And then you take your sides and the sides of grooves and all ready to put together. Then you use your bevel square to determine the number of, of dovetails you put in. First you have to put this on like this, then clamp it down so there won't be any vibration. And I'll chill this out very quickly. You have to use the right size chisel so that you won't go by your dovetail. Now can you see that as I've done this here? See, I broke that dovetail down on that side. When I turn it over, I won't put the clamp on it this time so you can get a better view of it. See, and there's your dovetail. I'm just completing the molding that will go on here like this. Um, the molding is cut. We have two, two shaper heads and make two passes across the, the piece of wood. And then it's still a little rough, so I'll take a scraper. This is a, it used to be a putty knife, which Ed ground down to a round shape. We end up using it quite often for these inside curves on uh, molding. And this is, there's a little, there's a little nub here, a nubby, as Tom likes to call them. And we just take it, and a series of these, right, and slowly remove that. The, the most important thing is the wood. I mean, the, it's wood, and our, and our whole dedication is to wood and woodenness. And we try to, uh, wood is universal. Well, my hope is that our work will appreciate rather than depreciate that instead of having a piece of furniture just become a, a used piece of furniture, it'll become more valuable in time. And I would like to think that a good design is, will last forever.